They asked me once on French television whether I thought that there were love stories that ended well. And my answer was that a love story that ends well is a love story that ends not. I'm not sure we really have a choice. You know, something happens to us which is fairly mysterious and it is always viewed as an accident. This is why in all languages, what is said is that we fall in love. We never rise into love. We always fall in love and this is true in every language. You think you're in love, fine. Can you analyze the other person? I doubt it. But what you can analyze is the relationship you have with that person. Does that relationship make you feel quiet, relaxed, comfortable? Is that person in a model-to-model -model relationship? In other words, does she attack you? Does he attack you? Does she challenge you? Does he challenge you? Do you have this type of challenging relationship or do you have an appeased type of relationship that makes you feel better? Are you able with that person to spend time without talking? That's something also, it's a, it's, it's a characteristic of real love of being able to be with somebody without needing to talk, without needing to put on a show, just by being there, feeling good because you're there. In other words, not being in a rivalrous situation, not being in a... Mimetic desire is just a desire which is generated by the imitation of the other's desire. If we see a friend ordering a beer, we might be tempted to say, I'll have one too. That's, in a very simple example, the mimetic desire. It is very clear that when you go with a friend shopping, especially when you're a woman shopping, she chooses a dress. Immediately her friend who is shopping with her will say, well, yeah, that's a very nice dress. I'd like the same. She has caught the desire for that dress because, of course, the dress in itself is not very important. What is important is that this dress has been uh, elected, has been selected by the other. And this selection has given it an added value, which is invaluable because it is the, the desire of the other that has sort of made this dress into something very special. And I think that mimetic desire in that respect uh, modifies the object, transfigurates the object. Can you say transfigurates? Transfigures. Transfigures the object. In other words, the object becomes something different from what it is. It's not just a dress. It's the dress that has been selected by my friend. This is not just a watch. It's the watch that's been worn by Leonardo DiCaprio or Cindy Crawford or whoever. This is not just the perfume. This is the perfume that is worn by uh, Julia Roberts. That's not just, you know, a hotel. It is a hotel where Elizabeth Taylor stayed. And uh, I don't know, other stars have stayed in that hotel. So that hotel is really very, very, very special, you know? And of course, as you can see in all those examples, the, the quality of the object itself is totally irrelevant. Whether you eat well in that hotel or whether the beds are comfortable, you don't care. Whether this watch will work, works well or gives you the right time or doesn't, you don't care. Whether this dress is suits you or doesn't suit you, 
or the, the color suits your hair or your, your eyes, is not, you don't care. This car is fantastically desirable because it is, you know, you see that in it, you see, I don't know, you see James Bond right, driving the car, but you don't care about the way this car works, how much gas it consumes, whether it's comfortable to sit in, you don't care. The qualities of the object are totally irrelevant to desire. Of course, nobody, no patient ever is going to come to my office and say, I am imitating my boss, I am imitating my friend, and therefore I am desiring his wife, who is very pretty in my opinion. Actually, I finished by realizing that she's prettier than mine, so I am desiring her because she's my best friend's wife, so on and so forth. But uh, nobody would say that. But what I've realized is that what they come to tell me, all of them, is I have a problem with this person. Either my mother, my sister, my boss, my spouse, whatever. And she or he is against me. In other words, they come and complain about a rivalry between themselves and somebody else whom they designate. And of course, this rivalry stems out of imitation. Why is this person my rival? Because I want the same thing that he does. And this is very true in couples where the, the, the woman comes or the man comes and says that my spouse is not nice to me, is you know always criticizing me and so on and so forth. Why is that? It's because they're both desiring the same thing, not an object. But in couples, most, most, most often, what they both want is power. Right, there are two types of jealousy. The jealousy, as I would say, of the third party, that is the one that is represented in old French theater plays. You have the husband, the wife, and the lover or the husband, the wife, and the mistress. In other words, it's always three people, and then one of them suddenly realizes that the other one is having an affair with the third party, and that's the first type of jealousy you can have. And that jealousy is extremely difficult to handle, makes the person who is jealous suffer, but he suffers on, I would say, realistic grounds. It is quite obvious that if you suddenly realize that your wife is having an affair with somebody else, it's going to take you a lot of energy and a lot of self-control not to go and kill the guy or strangle your wife or both. Or else, what you can do nowadays, because it's so easy to do, you can file for a divorce and then you get into all those, you know, uh, lawyers' problems and so on and court proceedings and everything. But the second type of jealousy is the one that infiltrates the couple itself. In other words, the one that perverts the relationship between two people. Now, those two people constitute a couple. It can be a man and a woman, or it can be two men or two women. That's totally irrelevant. The sex is irrelevant in this case. But those two can be allies or can suddenly see jealousy develop among themselves. In other words, one of them gets a promotion in his job. The other one is pissed because he didn't get the same promotion. One of them makes more money than the other. The other one is pissed because why does he or she make more money than I do? And therefore, what happens is that the one that is jealous, if that kind of jealousy tries to diminish the merit of the other by being nasty. For instance, you know, for very trivial things, like the husband comes to home, home and says, darling, you know, 
we don't realize, but today I got promoted and the president of the company said, you're a great guy to me. Do you realize that? And the wife, who is then eaten by this second type of jealousy I was mentioning earlier on, would say, who the hell do you think you are? What's that? I mean, you come and tell me that you're a great guy? You know, why don't you lose weight? Why don't you stop smoking? Why don't you take care of yourself? Straighten up your tie. Take me out. Invite me out to dinner. Do something. And by the way, you didn't get the garbage out. <laughs> you know? So this is the type of jealousy that destroys the relationship between two people, especially couples. But it also can also be uh, roommates. It could also be uh, business partners. This happens very often between business partners. They, they sort of get pissed and they, they, they destroy the company, actually, because of their fights. And uh, many of things have happened like that way. And also it happens in wars where two generals, where two generals get, you know, rivalrous to each other. They may lose the war because of their rivalry. This is why Napoleon said something very profound. He said, you know, bear in mind that one bad general in chief is always better than two good ones. What is the wisdom way to avoid that trap? This wisdom way has been many times commented in many philosophers and sages in the world. The way to do it is to desire what you already have. To continue desiring the wife that you married 20 years ago or 30 years ago. To continue desiring the car that you bought two or three years ago and not constantly wish you had the other one that just passed by or that your neighbor just bought. And as Voltaire put it, the wisdom is to take care of your own garden, to cultivate and work on your own garden, the one that belongs to you without constantly comparing. The comparison is a path to hell not compare it to the wider garden or the greater garden or the greener garden to the right or the smaller garden to the left. The one You look at, at, the, at the greater garden with envy and to the smaller garden with contempt. That's a path to hell. You have to concentrate on your own garden and continue desiring what you already have. Love is something mysterious. But what is love in terms of psychology? The feeling of love is a feeling of confidence, harmony, in other words, lack of rivalry. In a nutshell, love is the, is the paradigm for non rivalrous relationship. Therefore, anything that can create rivalry would destroy love. But love also, on the other hand, can prevent us from rivalry, can be a sort of a cure for rivalry. And this, of course, has been emphasized very much in the gospel, has been very much emphasized in, very, in various wisdoms and religions around the world, mainly in the, in the gospels. And let's not forget that Jesus Christ recommended that we should, above everything, love each other, love one another. <laughs> 